The time to stand up is now. We are not afraid of the virus or government. We are coming together as a global community to address a global crisis and as local communities to support the most vulnerable. We encourage everyone to persist in living well while staying safe and informed and helping others do the same. We support the medical industry as best we can by maintaining the strength of the economy and our communities. From governments all over the world, we demand they, one, remove all legal and regulatory barriers that interfere with a rational response to COVID-19, including healthcare industry regulations, trade restrictions, curfews, and forced lockdowns. Two, immediately release all relevant information being kept from the people and commit to complete transparency. Three, commit to a policy of no forced vaccinations under any circumstances. Four, respect the individual right to choose medication without government approval. Five, commit to no bailouts for banks or big businesses. Six, allow people to go to work and determine for themselves appropriate safety protocols. Seven, open state-owned buildings and property to camping and occupancy by the homeless and remove all restrictions on relief programs, including food banks and shelters. Eight, maintain or improve, not compromise, our current standard of civil liberties. Nine, Release all non-violent victimless inmates and support their transition back into society. 10. End all armed conflict. This is it. No more war. No more crippling economic sanctions or embargoes. The human family pulls together from now on. We will share this message every day until these demands are met. We will do whatever it takes to achieve these goals. We will assemble online and in person, wearing masks, bandanas, and gloves, maintaining six feet of separation if necessary. We will take responsibility for our health and for those around us while developing creative new ways to connect and build community. We will not let physical separation and good hygiene turn into social distancing. We will stand up to fear, stress, and panic, none of which are good for a healthy immune system. We will stand together to say, hashtag, we are not afraid. Thank you so much for tuning in to Adam versus the man today for Corona Phobia Day 10. We are here in the No Force One studios somewhere in the Dallas area. I am joined on the bus by none other than Samantha Morgan Miller Kokesh. And did I mispronounce it? You're like rolling your eyes at me already. Normally it takes you like a few minutes. I have to actually say something meaningful for you to roll your eyes at me because right out of the gate here you, you don't have a middle name you ins i yes i do no I'm you not, don't i'm not miller either you're samantha morgan miller kokesh that's two and two there's no name in the middle Carnabucci. okay so samantha morgan miller Carnabucci kokesh so then <laughs> then miller is your middle okay fine all right and get your wife david name, dunlop clover joining us from the front seat today. We've all been following the news. We've all been watching what's going on. We've got a lot of important updates to bring you, but most importantly, the We Are Not Afraid manifesto. And uh, I am really excited that we have so much support for this. If you are just tuning in now, go read the statement that is in the description for this video. Uh, it is a really critical message. This is the time for us to stand up. Right now, we have a, a point where fear is really dominating the conversation, where uh, 
there is a growing anger. And at some point very soon, that anger is going to outpace the fear. And we need to make sure that the American people know what to be demanding, how to stand up, and what are appropriate measures to take to fight back, to stand up. So uh, this is what we're focusing on today. If anybody has any questions, one of the things I really want to make sure we get into with the comments, and of course we've got Sam and David watching the comments, is that people have questions. All of the points uh, in that 10-point plan were very, very carefully considered and worded very precisely. So, uh, excuse me, if, if anybody has any uh, questions about what would what is included in this, what isn't included in this, please put the put them in the comments. We'll be sure to be getting to those uh, throughout the show. And uh, I encourage everybody to share this. Cut and paste that text. Uh, if you if you can share this video, share this video. Uh, we are building a community and a conversation uh, around these ideas of, of staying calm, uh, addressing the concerns with the virus while addressing the bigger threats that we see from the government response and helping people come together and figure out for themselves, for ourselves, reasonable ways of dealing with this. Wow, it is hot in Dallas today. Holy crap, and a humid, getting nasty here. Um, can I show everybody what you're wearing, baby? I'm just going to turn the camera around real no, quick. Don't. Yeah, ready? Here it comes. Is that gonna do it? Double tap. All right. Okay. My my super sexy wife. Hi. All right. Um, she doesn't want to be on camera for the show today, but you can see how hot it is here, and it's not just because she's in the bus. But uh, <laughs> we got a lot of important news stories to bring you today, including the history segment that we didn't get to yesterday. We've got uh, a, a variety of uh, historical events with pandemics and, and other viral outbreaks that we want to cover for historical perspective. If you haven't been paying attention to my Facebook feed or YouTube or anything else on social media that I'm doing to promote these debates, we've also got the Libertarian Party presidential primary coronaphobia debate series in full swing. Just this morning, posted the debate from last night with Brian Ellison, so please check that out. That is somewhere down on the page after this if you're still looking for more libertarian information entertainment and positive constructive conversations these debates have been amazing i'm, I'm so happy with the the format and the the, the positive uh, collaborative nature uh, in in these conversations so please check out those debates just right after this we are going to be connecting with sam rob uh sam rob 2020.com uh, another one of our great libertarian party presidential primary candidates and we've got a few more lined up for later this week so stay tuned uh haven't heard from a few people but um We'll get to the people I've heard from before we start calling out people who are afraid to debate. Yes, there are some. Stay tuned. There is going to be a little drama around this that I didn't anticipate in this debate series because we really have been uh, running as a team. And I think even now or even uh, especially now in, in this particular crisis that we find ourselves in, it's really important that uh, libertarians hang together. Now, if we don't hang together, we will surely hang separately as uh, Benjamin Franklin said. So today we're going to be just looking at this this big picture that we find ourselves in now with a third of the world population on lockdown. The flatten the curve of tyranny chart is more relevant than ever before, especially with the uh, we are not afraid manifesto. So uh, we're going to be getting into all of that. Some really scary stuff going on today. In uh, in the comments, as Sam says, it's written above the video. So please check that out. If if you are just joining us now, stop listening. Stop listening. Go back and read the manifesto. If you didn't hear me, read it out loud at the beginning of this broadcast. And one of the cool things about this is I'm not... If you didn't notice, I didn't put my name on it. Uh, it was a collaborative effort. We had a lot of help with this. And this, this we are not afraid message. This could be the thing that gets us to this part of the curve right here. And if we are able to have a moment of awakening here instead of falling, and I'll explain this as, as I, I've been doing since we uh, we came up with this graphic. I'll be explaining exactly what this means towards the end of the show for people who, who haven't been tuning in. But this is the, the exciting point right here. If this is where the anger 
exceeds the fear and we have a catalyst for major change maybe it's this list of demands man it's one of my favorite songs by the way look it up if you don't know it's saul williams list of demands used to be in the intro music for adam versus the man really enjoying this format if you like what you're hearing every day now and i am doing this seven days a week Kind of brings me back to the uh, the early days of Adam versus the Man, and we were only doing the show five days a week then. But our slogan, because we were posting content seven days a week, was Adam versus the Man, anchoring the internet seven days a week. Well, now here we are, actually live for at least an hour, seven days a week. Uh, and I don't know, we might keep up this format if people like it. I, I don't mind making this part of my daily routine. I really enjoy talking to you all this way. I, I love the comments. Wendy Parker, hello from Michigan. Uh, Candice Elias, uh, or Elise, uh, can you repeat the manifesto? Yeah, please. Uh, check out the text at the, at the top of this. Um, Candace says, oh, wow, right after that, just in the last couple of minutes, having gone back and read it, Candace says, it sounds like a new American Declaration of Independence. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, again, I had a lot of help figuring out the wording here, but uh, it's it's not American. It's, it's, it's really uh, global in scope. And one of the things that's so cool about this is it's just, I'm just putting out this little block of text. With a, with a hashtag in it. And if, if it takes off, if it keeps going, every time it is shared, it has the potential to mutate. You know like a virus if people want to copy it make their own version uh, add things take things out change the language whatever it is that you want to do there's no intellectual property claims to this of course intellectual property a whole other government racket we could get into uh really please take this make what you will of it if, if this is something that you see as a positive message that resonates with you use it to wake people up use it to take advantage of this opportunity for libertarians to step up and apply our principles in a time of crisis and show how those principles can make things better, but also to raise awareness in a way that propels us to a greater state of freedom in the wake of this crisis. Mimi uh, Robson writes, I think you need to add that the government needs to reduce all regulations that are keeping testing from being available. Now, Mimi, I, I very much appreciate that, and a lot of people have specific concerns, and if you wanted to write your own version and add that language in, please do it, and if that gets out and that's more effective, that's great. I considered that point specifically, and I think that that's covered in point one, and, and I guess uh, Sam is right. If we're going to be referencing back to the We Are Not Afraid manifesto text during the show, that we should be able to uh, to look at the text. So we've got it here on, on my other phone. Uh, so when it says, remove all legal and regulatory barriers that interfere with a rational response to COVID-19, including healthcare industry regulations, trade restrictions, curfews, and forced lockdowns. I, th I think that covers uh, you know, regulations that keep testing from being available. If you want to make it more explicit, if you think that makes the message more viral, please feel free to add, modify, uh, what, whatever you think is appropriate. Um, all right, so Marcus already posted it in there. And for people who are sharing the text, I should point out that uh, right when we were about to go live, uh, I was considering whether I, to, to change the, the hashtag uh, to, from coronavirus to COVID-19, and I left it out. So put it back in, whichever one you think is appropriate, or add a bunch of other hashtags. Uh, we've been referring to this as the coronavirus for, I don't know, a, a few months in, 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 in the public discourse. And it seems like just... In the last week or so, the mainstream media, in order to, oh, well, we're more credible than, than all those plebes referring to it as the coronavirus. We're going to use the formal name COVID-19. All right. I, 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 let me know how you feel about the terminology here. Uh, COVID-19, one less syllable. Coronavirus sounds a little more casual. Um, but I don't want to play into their messaging if that's a consideration here. So please, if, if you see that, uh, you know, let me know. Versus the man. We said that in the late 60s. That's uh, Jeanette Keller Graver. Yes, it is kind of uh, a, a throwback to the, the way uh, that the, the uh, 60s counterculture movements referred to the man. Stand up to the man. Take down the man. Adam versus the man. So... Um, Let's see, Stephen Powell, dang, got to keep going, my friend, indeed. And uh, Marcus Pulis, our, our press secretary, who's been doing a great job setting us up with interviews during this time, uh, said he just finished the first till in his garden. Hashtag, we are not afraid. Yeah, getting out, going about his life as best he can. So please 
read that manifesto if you haven't already go back share it modify it whatever it takes and i'm i'm just really excited that now we have something that we can we can see that we can all uh you know engage with and share and and you know give people a message that is is both reassuring and hopeful and, and empowering and i think that's, that's right now when when everybody's afraid people are feeling kind of helpless and I, I really want to change that. If, if we can empower people and say, look, it, even if it's just sharing this text, even if it's just you know a little copy paste, whatever, whatever the case may be, that's uh, I, I think that's that's a huge step forward from well, we're going to sit around and bitch on our phones and online and on social media, and we're going to sit at home and you know deal with our own situations and, or, or react in our communities or, or do our mutual aid. It, it's not enough to just be in your own bubble, in your own world right now. As it says in the manifesto, we are a global community coming together to address a global crisis and local communities coming together to support the most vulnerable. In doing that, it's not just important that we do it, but that we spread that information, especially in the wake of the uh, propaganda pandemic, all of the coronaphobia, all of the uh, things that are being blown up out of proportion, all of the fear mongering around this. You know, it's really important that we have a sense of community uh, as, as conscious ethical people who are trying to help out in this crisis who want to support our community so please keep all of that in mind and take some leadership um see alex flores uh coronavirus refers to a class or type of viruses we are currently battling two new strains an s and an l strain of sars cov2 yeah so uh, that, you know if, if if that's the case and and, and covid19 is, is is just one specific one of those uh, I'm inclined to think that the the sort of layman's term, uh, the, the the more general catch. I mean, what if we we're standing up to COVID nineteen and they trick? See, I see. This is okay. So David, you you had some thoughts about this, right? Oh, yeah. That the, about, about the terminology, and I understand that. Yes, I, as Alex said, coronavirus is kind of a generic term, right? COVID nineteen refers to a very specific virus, and if they say, "Well, now it's not COVID nineteen, now it's COVID S or COVID L," we don't know what we're talking about. And if we play into this, yeah, I think. You know, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I think I just figured out the reason we need to stick with coronavirus as the terminology because if we let them play this game, they're going to change the terms, and it's going to be harder for us as a people to stand up to the mainstream media and government megaphones blast well it's not covid-19 anymore it's sars cov 2 dash 5368 right, or yeah, yeah. slash l or slash d right Agreed, but you had so you but, I, I, I was saying that the covid-19 just looks slightly more professional professional but yeah I, I said it, it was a non issue yeah well now it's an there. issue now i figured out why it's an issue right. we're going to keep calling this coronavirus right. because if we start calling it covid-19 we're playing their game we're making it easy for them to change the messaging and to distract us further and make it harder for us to talk about what we're standing up to and of course it's the virus well we well we have the new term so we know what we're talking about and you the people don't like no it's still this coronavirus right pandemic whatever it is so um before we get into the news stories today do we have any other comments or questions about the manifesto in particular that we want to get into i really want to discuss all of these points i mean i just just this text i'm there's so much in this that y you all know how passionate i am uh, about these issues but especially right now and i think right now there are a lot of people who are very very passionate about these issues because they're hurting them and Part of my libertarian optimism is based on the idea that we are all victims of the state one way or another, and that more and more people are going to start seeing themselves as specifically victims of the state. You know, I think it's every American at this point, maybe, maybe not a few young people, but hey, if you were born in a hospital and have a birth certificate and are on the list and we're subject to, to vaccinations and uh, you know, all the, the things that go along with that, yeah, you're, you're kind of a victim of government too. But how many Americans have been arrested for victimless crimes, been through a bad divorce, uh, custody battle, been worried about the government taking their kids, had their job uh, disappear because of government regulations, lost a small business because of taxation. We're all victims of government. And I, I part of my 
uh, you know, belief in how we're going to come together to stand up to government as a society is to say, all right, we're done being victims. We're not going to be victimized anymore. We're all going to stand together. And I think we passed that point a long time ago. I mean, Sam, David, at what point could we say every American has been a victim of government one way or another? Uh, did, did we cross that barrier like in the 50s or 60s? You know, like, how, how, how far back do you want to go with this? Oh, it goes far back. Yeah, I mean, maybe before that. Uh, there were enough people, you know, in, in, in the country prohibition who, and the... yeah, I mean, prohibition kind of victimized everybody too, right? Uh, there, there have been other, I mean, the civil war, civil war was, it was, but even I, I think before society became so connected with communication and infrastructure, you could kind of live uh, apart from that if you wanted to separate yourself from that. Right. And, uh, you could kind of live free in America. And I still think the overall trend is we become more free over time, and we live without slavery. We, we, you know, women have the right to vote. We have a higher standard of civil rights than ever before. But uh, it's harder to escape the victimization of government as it has grown into this modern bureaucratic monstrosity that we have today. So this collective victimization identity, and I'm not playing victim politics or anything like that, but we are all victims of the United States federal government. And so if we can come together and, uh, and, and do something about that, this is, uh, you know, this is the opportunity. This is the time where we have a unique moment in history where the government reaction to the coronavirus has made victims of all of us at the same time, where we are all going to suffer. So, any any other comments, guys? Anything about this so far that, that we think we uh, you think we should get into before we get into the news? No. No. Nope. Nothing. Mm -mm. Uh, Manny Sevilla says I was a victim of government since the age of sixteen due to cops' paranoia over the war on drugs. Um, Joseph Nudd. We lived in caves 20 years ago. That is true. That I, I, I can attest to that. I lived in a cave for about a month 20 years ago. I lived in a cave last year. Oh. I, I, I don't know. I don't know 20 happens. years ago. Uh, was there a couple zeros missing from that number, perhaps? Uh, yeah, but uh, no, I, I'm joking. It, sort of. I, I have a, a tire cave. Uh, that, that I mean, I call it that. It's a, a one-room building that I built at the Garden of Freedom as a warm-up in my Earthship construction uh, project there. And while the bus, No Force One, was in the shop for about a year, uh, I was still on the road a lot, you know, staying in, in hotels and, and with supporters, sleeping uh, on couches and spare beds and futons and stuff like that, getting around with the presidential campaign and, uh, and everything else that I've been doing in my activism, staying in Airbnbs, things like that, you know, funds and circumstances allowing. And uh, when I was at home, about half the time, yeah, I, I lived in the tire cave. Last year, I, I spent most of my nights living in a cave. That's where I'm about to live. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah, and also, I, I don't want I don't want to uh, I don't want to get into this story too much because because we are not set on our plans yet. Like I said, we are parked okay. out in the Dallas area right now, and what it's looking like we're going to do is bug out to the Garden of Freedom in uh, Juniper Wood Ranch, Arizona. And part of that is that uh, I I. I'm not as optimistic as I was a few days ago, even, that this was going to kind of peter out or, or level off in a week or two. Um, and again, back to, uh, back to the chart, the curve of tyranny. You know, if this is where we are now, there's a sign The question is, it, you know, I, I don't think, again, if, if everything goes to shit and it gets a lot worse and we get up here into forced vaccinations and full on martial law, and by the way, there were a couple stories just today that that has me thinking we're going more in this direction. Uh, police in Cincinnati, forced vaccinations in Italy. We'll come back to that. But if this is where we are now, and you know, I, this is what I'm predicting here is that the the amount of tyranny, the government response here is going to start to level off. The question is, how long is this little bit of the line right here, right? Of things continuing to get worse at the rate they're getting now. And one of the reasons I think this is going to level off is because Donald Trump is already looking at, oh, whoops, I fucked the economy. Uh, we're going to want, we're going to want to do something about that because I want to get reelected, and that they're going to have to address certain aspects of, of the economic restrictions facing America today. But this, how long is this? 
You see what I'm still looking at here, David? Oh, yeah, yeah. This little part of the chart, how much longer are things going to keep getting worse? And then how sustainable will that state of bad shit happening be over time coming back from that? So I'm, I'm seeing now, you know, mainly by uh, the nature of the virus and, and the social momentum, I still think it's, it's uh, in a week or two, the anger is going to surpass the fear. But the general state of lockdown uh, is, is probably going to last for at least a few more weeks. Um, impossible to really predict. You know, we're all making guesses here. Uh, even even Trump doesn't know. The, you know, the greatest experts in the world don't know. And there is a, a natural phenomena X factor here of the virus itself. Of course, humanity can respond. Um, I'm, I'm still hopeful that we come to this point of, of the remember these blue lines here are the uh, the virus caseload this is the uh, you know the flatten the curve concept keep it under this this imaginary line where the where the healthcare system is is overrun some people you know i've seen graphics where the, the dash line is down here you know i'm still optimistic uh, about this possibility that that we could come to a sort of scientific turning point in the natural phenomena itself and i keep hearing rumors i, I haven't seen any uh, you know, big credible stories. If anybody wants to, uh, to please post links in the comments. David and Sam are going to be looking th looking at them throughout the show. Uh, that vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C, and megadoses. Again, I, I almost I don't want to spread rumors, but I am confident that there are doctors all over the world now experimenting with different treatments, and it's really fucked up. This is why it's one of the points in the manifesto to have complete transparency. It's really fucked up that we don't know. We don't know what effective treatments are. I mean, even today, it just came out pink eye. Pink eye might be an indicator symptom. How did we not get that information sooner? You would think that would be critical to public health. They say, hey, you know, dry cough and 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 flu-like symptoms and difficulty breathing uh, are, are symptoms. Well, hey, another possible indicator is you might be getting pink eye, uh, you know, before those symptoms set in. The other one, uh, what was what was the other the other? Um, oh, that you can't taste or smell. Yes, thank you, dear. Uh, that if you lose your sense of taste or smell, that that's a very strong indicator that you have uh, the coronavirus. So. In that sense, where where are we? Yeah, where are we going? Where are we going with this curve? Um, I think even even if we get to to this turning point now, it's going to be a, a couple weeks at very least, unless they come out and say, "Oh yeah, eating elderberries is the cure, and if you eat one elderberry, you're immune from the virus." And uh, or, or starting cocaine is one of the rumors, right? If you start coke, you won't get the virus because. I don't know, burns out your respiratory system or something. Uh, I would think smoking pot would be a better cure because it cures everything else, right? But uh, <laughs> that, that you know, we might have, uh, you, you know, some, you know, silver bullet treatment. Even that would take a couple weeks to see this curve flatten, to see government restrictions ease. So at least this, this part of the line is going to keep going for a little while, which means that this general period of, of economic unrest and, and partial lockdown and what we're seeing now is a failure in law enforcement uh, and, and, and a lot of basic services, that that's going to continue. So what we're looking at uh, right now for people who want to, so that you guys know exactly what, what, what our uh, safety protocol is in regards to the virus, we were... Uh, we, we believe that the, the last chance we had of... Um, likely exposure was at the Illinois State Convention, which was uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, so our, we're, we're, we're imposing on ourselves a, a two-week quarantine period, and that's not not go out, not interact with people. Obviously, you know, we've been doing that, but uh, we if, if we ever are in an area where we're actually physically interacting with other people, unless un, until, you know, we discuss what we're doing for, for appropriate sanitation, hygiene, physical distancing, you know, we're going to, we're not going to be wearing bandanas in the bus, pulling up to, to people, hey, you know, like banditos, but uh, it, it, like if we go to pump gas, 
you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my bandana before I get out of the bus. I'm gonna put on gloves before I touch the gas pump. Oh, and here's, here's Clover with, he's so much more fashionable than I am. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. That's so beautiful. Yeah. No, so we're gonna have we're gonna we're gonna get freedom bandanas made too. We've got some cool graphics with people um, actually putting uh, bandanas on people in in memes with the freedom logo on it, which is some people people have been asking for that for a long time. This is our merchandising opportunity: freedom bandanas, uh, so that you can wear them as face masks. You gotta wear it in the next uh, uh, debate. Oh, for the next the, debate? The, yeah, right, the next the, online the, debate. Well, I just want to make sure no one gets debate. corona through, oh, the next live debate, yeah, yeah. have the freedom bandana yeah. on. But, we'll like, see. Leave it for that. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well the, the next time libertarian presidential candidates meet in person for a debate, we're going to have a lot of fun with this one way. It's going to be like a, like, kind of like a reunion of, of elbow bumps instead of hugs and kisses and all that. But uh, it, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, so look forward to that. So... Uh, Tentatively, what what we're looking at doing is uh, limiting our our movement um, until we hit the end of that quarantine period next sat or this Saturday, and you know we're going to keep making plans, preparations, getting this message out, doing these live videos, uh, doing the debates. I've got a lot more footage piled up too. Uh, once we get settled. Um, you know, like my speech at the uh, the Church of Cannabis in Indianapolis with Bill Levin. I can't wait to. Just, I want to rip that and post that and talk about my story. How I, I like just right before this all hit, I just beat four felonies and a misdemeanor and turned them into a. a well, I think now it's a hundred eighty dollar fine. I don't know if I should talk about this publicly, in in in, in this sense. Um, well, I'll put out the question here because I'm 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 on a def uh, I keep screwing up the term now. Um, deferred prosecution, delayed. What what was the term? Deferred trial. No, not deferred trial. Um, pretrial deferment. Yeah, so it's a deal between myself and the prosecutor. That's like it's 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 a lower level of probation where hey, don't get in trouble in my county for the next year, and this all goes away. So I was facing four felonies and a misdemeanor, and because I was so persistent over two years' time, I got it beaten, and I played the religious defense, and I filed a motion to dismiss based on religious freedom grounds. Um, and by the way, this was, uh, you know, with the the charges were uh, misdemeanor cannabis possession, felony tampering with evidence, and then felony cocaine mushrooms and dmt and in texas of all places yeah and in the pretrial deferment deal i had to pay a 180 dollar fine and i'm supposed to pay 25 dollars a month and if i don't they can haul me in and take me to trial but they really don't want to and i don't think they're going to take if i stop if i if i if i don't make any of my 25 dollar monthly payments you think they're going to come after me right now I doubt it. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's gonna happen. So I, I think I get. To, so the, the, the David. The reason I'm, I'm I'm putting out this question, talking about it like this, is can I brag that I turned four felonies and a misdemeanor into a hundred eighty dollar fine? And fuck you, I'm walking away. <laughs> like, and they're not gonna come after me at this point. And if I was a lawyer, I'd be going, Hey, I just turned for my client four felonies and a misdemeanor into $180 or it, the way it adds up, it's $25 a month over a year is $300. So $480 if I were to pay the whole thing, but I'm kind of like, ah, come at me, bro. Uh. Now, the only question is if they're going to give me my stuff back and you know, maybe I should, maybe this is my next negotiating point with the, uh, with the DAs. And by the way, I know a lot of people know the original story here that the day we announced the presidential campaign, I got pulled over twice and was uh, raided illegally in, in the bus with a whole long story there. And I fought this for two years now. And I've been totally quiet about it until it got to this point of resolution because I wanted to... to for strategic legal reasons to keep the public pressure out of the situation. I'm glad I did. It was absolutely the right play. And now it's like, do I want to brag uh, about, you know, oh, maybe he was driving around with drugs in his RV. But if I was a lawyer, hey, I, I got four felonies and a misdemeanor just tossed for my client. Amazing legal work as a deal, like in Texas. Um, so maybe my play now is, all right, when you give me my stuff back, I'll start paying you $25 a month and then get my stuff back and nah, then we'll see. <laughs> but um, 
where, where it was like, oh, back to back to our current circumstances here. We are uh, we are planning right now, and um, a couple things to see if, if if we commit to this plan. But we are we are looking at going home to the Garden of Freedom. Uh, we'll be starting. Uh, we're, we'll be going down to San Antonio for some vehicle repairs uh, later this week, and then coming. Then we're doing a little bit of a tour, uh, the coronavirus bug out tour, going going up from San Antonio to Austin to Dallas excuse me, uh, in, in, in Fort Worth area where we are now. And then, uh, maybe through Wise County, Decatur. See, you know, I wonder if I go into, uh, if I go into the police station there where they have the, my, my stuff in their evidence locker and be like, Hey, give me my stuff back. And, uh, or, or I'm going to cough on you. <laughs> They're going to arrest me for that. Of course. No, I don't advocate anything like that. Um, except of course, if it's necessary in self-defense to get a cop to leave you alone, really interesting circumstance. I posted this, uh, Facebook and Twitter, got some cool responses. You know, has anybody successfully used, uh, don't come near me. I have coronavirus as a way of getting out of an arrest. And there have been, uh, some really fun stories about that. Uh, so then we might, we might go up to Denver down to Phoenix, San Diego, LA. Yeah, Sam's really excited about that to see her dad in San Diego. San Diego, LA, Vegas, and then home to Ash Fork, Arizona, picking up people and supplies along the way. We got some room in the bus, hoping more for caravanners who can drive themselves and bring vehicles, but um, not totally set on this plan yet. In development, we will be uh, making final plans tonight and and hopefully tomorrow on the show be able to get into specific plans about that uh joseph nudd grab a mic and speak from the bus that's one of the things that i've wanted to do you know if uh if we win the nomination and we plan to uh one of the greatest things with this bus is that it is it's a pop-up event center and if, if we end up having massive crowds how cool would it be to have a pa system uh, with the bus. I actually already have one at home. We just have to bring it, you know, put it up on the roof. I'll go stand on the roof and give speeches from there. We'd have a lot of fun with rallies like that. So one more reason to support us in winning the nomination for team and the fed. All right. Last chance for comments, uh, before we get to the headlines, anything, uh, David, Sam, anything you guys want to share? No, no important questions. All right. The rainbow gathering is canceled in New Mexico. What? Which they don't even cancel those things. Like there. Rainbow are, gathering yeah. is canceled. Yeah. That's, that's not a thing. It's an April twentieth uh, gathering, and they're not having it. They're, that's well, like, David. Actually, but people are still gonna show up. But canceling the rainbow gathering the, the, the is like canceling a sunset. You can't do exactly. that. Exactly. Oh, I know. I know. They're can't so it's officially canceled, uh, but unofficially Mexico people are still going. Uh, to give hundred dollar fines to uh, anybody that is participating in gatherings over a hundred people or something like that. I'm pretty confident from what I know about rainbow gathering that if the New Mexico police show up and start trying to issue fines, a forest service will be there. A force. Well, yeah, there there are always government agents like that yeah. around rainbow yeah, gatherings right. watching yeah, them. The, the United States spends millions of dollars on the forest agents that follow rainbow all right yeah so uh sam what what is your top story for today um let's see italy has implemented mandatory vaccinations yeah this is a really big one what are the high points of this story did you did you did you get into it because it is a uh it is a really uh, this, this is a really critical story. So in, in the, uh, in the, we are not afraid manifesto. And by the way, I'm fixing the hashtag right now for my other phones. I realized I had my hotspot on so I can do this. So now you guys can go and just copy and paste the text. Hopefully that updates it while it's live. By the way, I put my PayPal link in there. Um, cause right now what we're doing is, is not really campaign stuff. Yes. Uh, separately behind the scenes. We are making phone calls and recruiting and organizing people for delegates to the Libertarian National Convention to win the nomination for Team and the Fed. Um, but really what we're doing right now, focusing on, on media production, addressing the coronavirus crisis and coronaphobia, 
um, is, is really more an Adam versus the man operation. And it's funny, I've seen some people say they're more comfortable donating to me directly, throwing me a few bucks rather than saying I'm donating to your presidential campaign where we have to, uh, you know, report it to the FEC and record uh, your, uh, what, employer and um, what's the other, that you're a U.S. citizen and, and all of that stuff. So this, this when we put it in the manifesto, that, uh, you know, no, commit to a policy of no forced vaccinations. I started writing this two days ago and, and a handful of the people who looked at it, some of my more normie friends, they, they were like, oh, forced vaccinations. Who's talking about forced vaccinations? Wake up this morning. Oh, Italy. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. So in this story, the forced vaccinations are fortunately uh, not just uh, draconian across the board, although... It is kind of draconian across the board to say all children are required to get these vaccinations. Twelve of them. Twelve. Mandatory vaccinations. Twelve them. different vaccinations. Yeah, so <sighs> it's inter Italy has introduced a law making 12 vaccines mandatory for preschool and school age children. Unvaccinated children's parents will be fined anywhere up to 75 hundred euros all right someone here sorry i got i got to interrupt because someone wants to give us money someone said uh cash app please can you accept cash app yes i believe i am already set up with cash app i oh hey i got it right here on my other phone as well um let's see if uh you get my profile there yep um dollar sign adam kokesh just like that if you want to help us out by cash app we greatly greatly appreciate it uh, someone on TikTok asked me the other day, how do you make money? Well, people who believe in this message, donate, make it possible for me to do this. Since I've been demonetized on YouTube and, uh, you know, lost uh, a lot of major sponsors in the crypto sphere when crypto started tanking, uh, you know, uh, what was it, about a year, year and a half ago? Um, it's, it's been a little hard, but yeah, I do get sponsorships here and there, but it's mostly donations. People who say, Adam, I like your message. I want to keep you doing this because... If I didn't have that support, it, you know, it, it wouldn't be worthwhile. To me, this is an indicator of, oh, Rainbow Jones says it's coming up backwards. I guess the whole screen is flipped. It's just Ad, Adam I Kokish. Typed it, I, I typed it in. Yeah, okay, that's easy. Well, dollar sign Adam Kokish. Pretty easy to remember. So back to the Italy story, forced vaccinations here. Uh, there, there's one really disturbing element to this. You know, we talk about in the United States, we have uh, mandatory vaccinations, but, but not really forced because you can opt out. Uh, most places in the United States where this is an issue, they allow for a religious exemption. And in Italy, uh, according to the story that I read uh, right before the program started, they uh, said that they are actually gonna find people and there is no religious exemption. So the other uh, big story, uh, I want to add on Please. to the Italian vaccination one. They already have 10 mandatory vaccines for children. Uh, some of them include polio, tetanus, hepatitis B, influenza B, measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, and chicken pox. That's just some of the ones that are already mandatory, and they're introducing a lot to make 12 more mandatory. And these are for preschool aged children. Oh, Italy. From the country that brought you Mussolini. Forced vaccinations. Yeah, and... and so uh, me. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, well, Sam Cartabucci uh, was able to escape uh, the, the totalitarianism of Italy. And, and oh, it's funny, we were just watching Golden Girls last night about um, how... Uh, uh, Oh, I'm for Dorothy's mom, Sophia. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, escaped an arranged marriage in Sicily and came to the United States as a pioneer in women's rights. Yes. And yeah, I, I think it's a really important uh, sort of under under respected part of of American history in regards to the relationship with Europe. That when people left Europe for the New World, it was it wasn't the statists, it wasn't the elitists, it wasn't the the, the bootlickers. It, it was the pioneers, the people who wanted freedom, who came out. So all the good Italians left, all the statist Italians stayed there. Next thing you know, Mussolini, World War Two. We'll just you know we'll we'll leave it at that. Uh, so. And anything else about the uh, the vaccine story for Italy or, or observations on your heritage, dear? <laughs> no, technically I'm Sicilian. Okay. But, uh, um, yes, uh, I just, that, con that does concern me, though, that they're doing this to children. And it's not just Italy, it's other European 
countries are beginning to do it too, and I'll have a list for you ready in a bit. All right, so next top story. I got one that's burning, but if, if you have uh, anything you want to get to next. Nope, just a couple of things about LA. I'll touch down after you. Okay, I think the most important indicator of where we are right now with the social breakdown that we're experiencing comes from Cincinnati. And in Cincinnati, Ohio, the police have sta stated that starting at 8 a.m. today, they will no longer be sending out officers to respond to a number of criminal situations. And they're not saying, this is this is really funny. I mean, that's not funny. It's tragic. This is, again, really fucked up shit we're watching happening live right now. This is, uh, you know, a, a critical time to be, be, be paying attention, watching the news. Uh, Cincinnati PD announced that they are not sending officers uh, to reports of assault if it doesn't include an injury to robbery to break for breaking and entering but they didn't say we're not going to respond to calls for drug crimes or regulatory i mean i don't know whatever whatever else they send police out to or that they, they say hey we're going to stop raiding uh you know, people's homes for for cannabis possession uh, like what but we're not we're not going to provide basic protection services for real crimes where th there is a role for the police. Now, semantic thing here, some libertarians will say, no, we shouldn't have any police. Th that's fine if you want to define police as a government security force as opposed to a community, private, or you know, voluntary security force. But this is a public safety service that government has a quasi-monopoly on, and they're just Eh, we're not going to deliver that service anymore. I mean, oh, geez, let's open the door for criminals because now any criminal in the Cincinnati area, anybody who would be inclined uh, to, to commit robbery is going to go, well, what are you going to do? Call the police? Go ahead. And there's uh, kind of an awakening happening right now where the old saying when seconds count, police are just minutes away, uh, is all the more relevant because it's not just that they're minutes away, it's that they're months away they're never coming and i think a lot of americans uh, especially libertarians who are paying attention to the news who who watch uh, the, the bad cop porn all the you know videos of, of cops being uh, uh, violent and offensive and and doing illegal shit on video uh, we know that you don't call the cops uh another gee, I keep, i'm making, making music references sending people to go watch videos rob hustle this is what happens when you call the cops. I think the, the title is just Call the Cops. Rob Hustle, this is what happens when you call the cops. And it's got a great montage of all these... You don't like my rapping? This is what happens when you call the cops. Your rights violated and you all get shot. This is what happens when you call the cops. All right, it's a great song. Please go check it out. Very, it, very honey, empowering. Right. Yeah. Um, so... I wonder where else this is happening. In New York City, another headline on Drudge Report today, 200 positive tests for coronavirus among NYPD officers. Mm -hmm. You think, you think if, if a cop comes, do you want to call the cops to come and help you out if they might be carriers of this deadly virus? Oh, of course not. So there's this fundamental breakdown of you know law enforcement and civilian relationships in the United States. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. You know, again, I'm still, I, I would stand by my prediction that in a week or two, even if things keep getting worse, there's going to be a, a kind of stasis point that, that we reach. So uh, what's your next news story, babe? LAPD puts hold on ticketing and towing vehicles. And um, I'm sure it's the same as the list you gave, but um, aside from that, what I really want to touch down on right now is the L.A. mayor threatens to cut water and power to non-compliant businesses. So, for all the business owners that are resisting, the LAPD, the L.A. mayor is threatening to cut off all water and power. <sighs> oh, we've got a problem? Let's make it worse. Might as well be government's motto, right? Uh, Matt Snook in a comment here. Anyone in Cincy, just arm yourself in case of acts of aggression. And I think that's actually really important that we all uh, up our security game as well. Because we are now at the point... And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been asking people this as well. You know, if you live in a big city, uh, are, are you concerned for your safety? 
uh, for, from uh, not the virus, but from other human beings, whether it's government or individuals. And, you know, the manipulations of government aren't just... Uh, you know, carried out by state agents. When the government has such a horrific intervention in the economy, it creates a lot of desperation. When they remove the legitimate check that police provide on criminal behavior and, and criminals feel a little more uh, free to, to go and commit crimes, we are all at greater risk. And we all have to be looking out for each other, taking appropriate security and safety precautions. And this is one situation where it's like, well, shit. I'm a felon. I can't even arm myself. I can't even protect myself. All I can do is carry pepper spray uh, or a taser. And in some places, it's illegal for me as a felon to do that. So uh, this is this is a really important point that we've come to where we really need to be looking out for each other and, and paying attention. So again, look, share this video. If you're watching right now, you can share this right now while you're watching. Um, you know, we're, we're actually, man, this, this broadcast has gone so fast. Yeah, it has. I feel like we need to go longer. We're, we're like 50 minutes in already, and I haven't even gotten to all of my stories, let alone gotten a chance to talk about the uh, We Are Not Afraid manifesto and everything people can do to get that out. So I, That's I, what happens when you take up time rapping. <laughs> it's not like I spend the whole show rapping. All right, so a couple other top stories I want to hit on, though. Biden was on CNN today. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, that was hilarious and embarrassing for him. Jake Tapper interviewing Biden on CNN. Have you been tested? No, I haven't been tested yet. I haven't shown any symptoms. Five seconds later, five seconds later, Biden goes, <coughs> and everyone is like, <laughs> no <laughs> symptoms, huh? And then Jake Tapper calls him out. This is a guy who's saying, I should be president of the United States. I should be in charge of all of this stuff. And he's going, <clears throat> and Jake Tapper goes, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President, you're you're supposed to cough into your elbow, not your hand. And Biden goes, oh, excuse me, you're right. Uh, yes, but, but I'm by myself at home, so it's okay. Ah, uh, all right, all right. And by the way, this is a, generally a good practice and something that... I, I guess I, I kind of have to admit, um, was, was not really, a, well, no, I, I can't, now I can't remember. If I asked you out of the blue, hey, do you cough into your hand or your elbow? In social situations, you know? I've always coughed into my elbow. You, okay, so when you're, so by yourself. And sneezing. Instant, instinctively, you cough into your hand, or you don't. Now, you don't usually cover your mouth when, you're, when you when buy yourself. When I'm by myself, no. Yeah, no, I've noticed you. Sneezing, I've, yeah, 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 sneezing, right. maybe. Yeah. But, yeah, in social situations, I've always coughed and sneezed into my in my elbow. That's yeah, I, I think I think <clears throat> I do forearm, which is like the lazy instead of going all the way to the elbow. Like, <laughs> you know, I do, like, do like that lazy. dab. <clears throat> yeah, right. No, but if, yeah, if I'm in, <laughs> you know, if, yeah, if I'm in front of somebody or if I'm out shaking hands, yeah, I don't cough into my hand. Right. Um, now someone's going to dig up footage of me coughing into my hand in front of people. And be oh, Adam, you're just as bad as Biden. But no, I, I think overall I've been a little bit. I've been kind of conscientious of that. I, you know, I cough. You know, I don't. You don't have to go all your to, to the forearm at least, so that you're not. The point is, obviously, you're not putting viral matter onto your hand and then shaking someone else's hand. And and yeah, I think this this is a generally positive side effect of uh, the coronavirus crisis that we are increasing our health consciousness and, and general hygiene and self care practices uh, like that. So. This this interview Biden on CNN, he's he's as bad as Trump. I I mean it's it's giant douche turd sandwich at at their best. I, I can't tell which is which, John, uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but they're they're both horrific candidates. What would you classify Bernie Sanders as? He could be either. It's up to him. I I want to give <laughs> I I respect Bernie's uh right to identify. Uh, by whatever gender they choose, uh, including uh, turd sandwich or giant douche. Uh, personally, I, aggressive of you. I identify as a unicorn, just just so, just so you know. Um, I, and I can use whatever bathroom I want. Um, I don't care what bathroom you use as long as you wash your hands. <laughs> All right, to the spending bill. This is the other top story, and we see this going around... Uh, social media a lot. This is a, a big thing. It's it's really exciting that one of the the unanticipated side effects of sending everybody home uh, for government is that we're watching you. 
And when uh, Congress proposes a $2 trillion coronavirus relief bill, and it has, I can't even remember all the numbers, I, I, like $200 million for the Endowment for Humanities. It, it, it's absolutely insane. This is a ripoff bill if there ever was one. So if you're, if you're watching this on my Facebook right now or, or on YouTube, wherever it is, go on my Facebook page, look down. There's a post that I shared um, from, oh, I forget the last name, Tammy, who said uh, their friends are all going through this bill and picking it apart. And it's just, it's, it's this you, an incredible list of, you know, hey, crisis happened. Hey, government's got all these, you know, ripoffs ready to go. It's like, uh, you know, uh, someone who's ready to rob you. They hear that police aren't responding to threats. Oh, well, let's go rob them. Hey, Congress, the people aren't paying attention. They're frightened. Well, let's screw them all over and steal from them in order to give to our friends. Check it out. The spending bill breakdown that, that Tammy has put together is, is really uh, a great deconstruction of this. So um, we talked about pink eye. Okay, two other stories I want to cover. Um, should we run through the history or should, should we skip that today? Are you going to do that tomorrow? We can do that tomorrow, yeah. The history will still be there tomorrow. But two other... One, uh, thing I'm going to add is to that history of the pandemics that changed history since 1350, I've also added the good that's come out of them as well as a highlight. Excellent, excellent. And I think that's really important right now. A big part of this We Are Not Afraid manifesto mm -hmm. is taking advantage of an opportunity to make things better, to bring some positive momentum and development out of this based on the increased awareness where everybody has seen how government is making things worse. I mean, you, no matter what your position on government or on the virus, you know, if you were just sort of tolerating the fact that government locks up innocent people every day, well, now it's like, well, it's locking them up and subjecting them to the coronavirus by keeping them in these giant human Petri dishes where even Harvey Weinstein has tested positive for coronavirus. And uh, speaking of Harvey Weinstein, um, L.A. District Attorney requests temporary custody of him hmm. so that he can face rape and sexual assault charges in Los Angeles. Face rape? How are they going to transport a prisoner with with the, who just has it positive for the coronavirus. Um, and really, he's already locked up. This is what they're, like, this is just... This is, yeah, they're trying to extradite him from from New York to Los Angeles to face different charges. I understand it from the closure aspect of Los Angeles victims. I do. However... There's bigger shit to worry <laughs> about right now. Yes. He's already locked up. He's not going anywhere. Ugh. Um, wow. Yeah. So two other important stories I want to cover today before we go and, and explain the uh, flatten the curve of tyranny graph. Uh, data tracking. We are seeing this most offensively in Italy, although they're doing it with public information from Instagram using uh, location tags and scrubbing personal information. But they have identified that somewhere uh, north of 35,000 Italians have violated stay-at-home orders and revealed publicly through their social media posts that they have done so. Now, whether they're essential personnel, I guess they can't tease that out of this data, but in the United States, we are seeing cell phone tracking data now being used to determine who is following social distancing protocol. Is your cell phone within six feet of someone else's cell phone? You might be in violation of a government order and now they can come after you. And this is, you know, we've been talking about this as libertarians for years, that this is a uh, encroaching threat when we have all of this data out there in the realm of uh, a, a statist society where government can use it against us. And now they have the excuse, it's turning up. This is something we absolutely have to fight. So um, I don't know, maybe maybe this is something that we need to, we need to figure out. Is this, is this covered in the, uh, well, yeah, I guess this is kind of covered in, in um, point eight of the uh, We Are Not Afraid manifesto, maintain or improve, not compromise our current standard of civil liberties. And it is uh, very typical in a time of crisis for government to expand their power and do that. Now, the other big story that I, I wanted to cover today is truckers. And what, what we saw today is that 
truckers are starting to feel the consequences of this. I think when, when the shutdown was announced, uh, the general assumption was that uh, you know, we're going to ask people to stay at home, but truckers getting out are going to be able to keep doing their job, delivering groceries and toilet paper so that in a crisis, no American butthole must go unwiped. But even that seems to be failing now at this point, as a lot of truckers are saying, yeah, it's not worth it. We have the savings. We're, I mean, if you're a trucker and, you know, you're delivering groceries and, and maybe you have, uh, fallen for some of the fear mongering and you're someone like me who's prepared to bug out why would you keep delivering food if you're really scared uh, of your fellow americans giving you a deadly disease uh, a lot of the truckers now are also afraid of government regulations on on their business even though uh the, the government is i think realizing that you can't restrict trucking and not basically kill everybody in America who depends on food delivered by trucks to, to, to live. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we are. And, uh, you know, more than, than ever before, I think people are going to be appreciating uh, the, the uh, central uh, infrastructure of the trucking industry. And, you know, as someone who drives cross country a lot, you know, I, I see these slogans on trucks, trucks move America, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, without trucks, you wouldn't be able to, uh, no, they don't say that, but you know, without trucks, you wouldn't be able, be to, able eat. to wipe your but, ass. Yeah. But there, <laughs> there's slogans like that on a lot of these, uh, you know, 18 wheelers where, you know, they're saying, Hey guys, you know, let's look out for truckers. Mm -hmm. We're a pretty essential part of this country. And more than ever before, Americans are realizing that. And, uh, un unfortunately I think that's being, uh, becoming a weak point. And if that goes, if, if the trucking industry right now uh, takes any kind of serious hits, again, if you uh, are a trucker who tested positive and you start, show, they're not going to let you show up for work. Right. Uh, maybe, I mean, maybe no one's going to stop you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, if you go to, um, you have to go through a way station or government inspection station. Um, are they going to be checking your, your temperature with a, you know, a scanner on your forehead? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But, I don't think the people who engineered this shutdown anticipated the effects on truckers, and that might be another flashpoint that we are coming to. Now, uh, any other, David, Sam, real quick, before I go to the chart, any comments or, or anything else that, uh, that we should respond to? Charles Akins mm -hmm. says, Adam, by the way, two cities here in Washington passed ordinance that would allow them to confiscate firearms during emergencies. Like they just passed that? Yeah, I'm assuming. I'm, I'm fact-checking it right now. Or maybe that's... Yeah, so, yeah, see, this is... A lot of state and local governments have these emergency... Uh, you know, provisions where in an emergency they can do all these things. And most of the time people as voters have kind of gone along with it or, oh, well, in an emergency, when's that going to happen? Or, well, we trust people in an emergency. But then this is where we see the worst case scenario uh, in terms of those uh, regulations being enforced because Trump declared a federal state of emergency. Oh, wow. They passed them two days ago. sad that's really sad it's just gonna make things worse if they start firearms confiscation it, it's you know everybody gonna get owns ugly. a gun is gonna go come and take it yeah and that <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think they're gonna get away with it but here's the scare is it, if they really try it's gonna get ugly yeah uh, mimi says los angeles has closed all gun sellers saying they are non-essential yeah in a crisis where the police aren't protecting you anymore protecting yourself that's not essential because we want to make you weak and vulnerable and we drunk. want to make you scared we want to, oh yeah you can be drunk you can be high how how the how how the fuck do you see this and not start questioning the fundamental motivations of government in an emergency they say no guns Weed and booze, that's okay. You can have those. Get high, get drunk, stay home, stay f afraid, stay manipulatable. Allow us to keep taking advantage of you. But no, whatever you do, don't figure out how to defend yourself. Yeah, already Marcus Mitchell in the comments. Come and take it. Indeed. Thank you very much. So I do have to go. I'm already late for uh, our interview with Sam Robb. Sam, if you're watching this, I'll be with you <laughs> very shortly here. So this is the flatten the curve of tyranny chart. Just going to explain this really quick. I do have to make one little modification here because I realized that some uh, in, in one of the graphics I saw the uh, dashed line of where you know we might be overwhelming the healthcare system is actually 
the uh, target for uh, flattening the curve of the virus. So uh, I hope all of you have seen various versions of the blue lines on this chart. And you can see here, this is what happens if we don't slow the spread of the virus and it peaks and comes down, that we are going to cross either a dashed line here or a, a dashed line here. That's the point at which the healthcare system is overwhelmed. We don't have enough ICU beds for patients who need critical care. And that's why the uh, general public call to action is let's flatten the curve. Even if this thing is hopeless in the sense of containment, if we are going to, uh, if basically everybody's going to get this, this is going to become like a flu that's just out there or another cold virus that's just circulating in the population, we still have to flatten the curve and slow it down just so that we don't cross this line, that we don't get a spike here. Now, I think that's the general prevailing wisdom. I do want to point out that there are uh, differing opinions. There are some experts who said, no, let it go, run its course, and get herd immunity as soon as possible. I don't think that's correct, but I just want to point that out. But here's the more important point. These green lines represent the curve of tyranny. And you, as you can see, it's not the same beautiful uh, sort of organic natural curve that the virus curves represent. But Here's the uh, the virus starting to take off. Here's a delayed response, government taking off in response. Now, where we are right now is right about here. And I'm still very optimistic, that, again, like I said before, that we could come to a quick turning point that, that we could beat the virus itself. But it's gonna keep going. The virus, like, we're even, even if we get that miracle cure today, there are going to be more cases. There are going to be more deaths because that didn't get out. And again, you can blame government for slowing down or possibly uh, squelching that information entirely, causing people to die. But if we were to turn around where we are with government now, you'd still see that tyranny continuing for a while, maybe dropping off. And then these steps coming off represent us taking power back over time. What I think is going to happen is it's going to keep getting worse for a while. We're not going to get this worst case scenario here of getting government all the way to full martial law, mandatory vaccinations, total lockdown. I do think it's going to start to level off. I don't know when. Part of it depends on this X factor of the virus itself. But where we're coming to, I think we're going to see it level off. I don't think they can keep making it that much worse. I do think there is a threat here in the United States of forced vaccinations, and that's why that's part of the We Are Not Afraid manifesto. But this is the important point right here. Instead of letting this tyranny continue and then fighting step by step, like, you know, like the Patriot Act, uh, you know, in, in response to 9-11, you know, we've had to fight back little bits of that piece by piece. But like cannabis prohibition is an example of this phenomena here medical, CBD, recreational, that's how we take that power back. If instead we have a moment of global awareness, we will be able to collectively, as a global community, see how government is holding us back, especially in situations like this, and really turn this to some positive momentum. Um, so please share the we are not afraid manifesto copy and paste it you don't have to share this post although for everybody who wants to share this live video please share this live video share like subscribe follow me all of that stuff if you're watching on youtube remember i have possibly the most shadow banned channel on youtube you can't rely on them to put me in your uh, notifications or in your news feed on facebook even yesterday this live video that we did was was temporarily taken down yeah. from my personal page yeah. i wonder if it got reviewed and put back but i was sitting there i you know i, I refreshed refreshed and wasn't there found it on sam's page because she had shared it there and then was able to reshare it so please uh we are not afraid Let's stand up, share this message uh, of love and positivity and people coming together globally in a state of greater awareness. Share this video, invite people to this conversation. Let's grow this audience, grow our potential to bring about a moment of positive change coming out of this crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mwah. Peace and love, y'all.